Hello, my name is Jacob and this is my YouTube channel. I'm a student of religious studies on Charles University and I'm also an author of a book about Marilyn Manson and about the crimes he has committed. My work is studying not only what exactly Marilyn Manson has done to more than 40 or 50 women and girls, but also I'm trying to explain through my work why and how he did it. Um, this video will be just an introduction into this topic and I will explain one of the main academic theses which I presented on the University of uh, Masaryk in Brno in our country and which deals with the theory of hyper-reality. This theory was first presented by a French philosopher uh, named Baudrillard and Baudrillard is something, maybe you're not familiar with his name, but he's the, the father of the thought that's behind the Matrix movies. Uh, you can even see in the Matrix movie how Neo takes his book. And it's this book called Simulacra and uh, Simulation, which explains the main thing that I try to convey in this message and which, in my opinion, is a good tool to study the art, the life and the crimes of Marilyn Manson. So Baudrillard presented this theory about hyperreality. If I should explain it in simplicity, it's basically this. Baudrillard thought that the more we have television, media and all this kind of stuff around us, the more we are drawn into this hyperreal world where we don't live anymore only in the reality itself but we have something like a media reality uh, pop culture and all these things and the life itself began begins to live and react inside of this new environment which is not only created by real events but also by media events so Baudrillard explains this on two topics, uh, one or terms. One is simulation and one is the simulacra or simulacrum. What is it? So simulation is basically any piece of art, something like this, which tries to resemble the original but is not the original. Um, so for example a photograph of a person that's a simulation of it right uh, if you would simulate it perfectly today it would be a 3d holograph of that person right so that's a simulation the other thing is simulacrum or simulacra that is more as an image uh, you could say an idol and the best way to convey it is idols of old religious gods, right? So Aphrodite, the statue of Aphrodite doesn't convey to, it's not about a real person, right? It's a personification of a thought. So according to Baudrillard, simulacrum is a piece of art which portrays something that is not real, but which gives an insight into the real. And these two topics, the, the simulations and the simulacra, they start to fill our life, our religious and social thoughts throughout the ages from the beginning, but in the modern time it becomes much more heavy. So how does this connect with Marilyn Manson? So when I studied this thesis from Baudrillard, I started to, because I'm a, I'm a long life, almost I would say past uh, fan of Marilyn Manson, uh, and this, this Baudrillard's thought uh, got me to the conclusion that Marilyn Manson, what we see today, is just a simulation of what Brian Hugh Warner once was. Let me explain. Brian Hugh Warner the original man behind Marilyn Manson, starred as an artist, right? And he made this band, Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids. It was only after he was rising to fame in the Antichrist Superstar era 
when he started calling the whole band Marilyn Manson. It was only Marilyn Manson now. But still it was Marilyn Manson and some of the key figures. And all of these band members, they had a name by a pop culture icon like Marilyn Monroe or uh, Twiggy, the, the model. And combined with a serial killer, right? So Charles Manson or Richard Ramirez or John Wayne Gacy and all other uh, mass killers, which are mentioned by the names of Marilyn Manson thought. Even this, from the beginning, is Marilyn Manson's diving into hyperreality, into the pop culture, because he uses this combination of uh, some pop culture icon and something really terrible, right? So he basically shows us how easy it is to wrap something horrible into this nice bubble. And that's what he does from the whole beginning. And that's also why he kept hiding all of his crimes for so long. So we are in this era when the whole band is Marilyn Manson, but um, that's in the era of Antichrist Superstar and Marilyn and Mechanical Animals and Hollywood. And in this era, although Antichrist Superstar is super violent, super horrible, in the two latter albums, uh, Marilyn Manson got a little bit different, right? <clears throat> Through the whole of this period, he's using androgynous um, symbols. He's sometimes dressed as a woman or he has breasts. So he's not a typical macho or like a chauvinistic guy, which he became much later. And that starts with his turn when he starts to, after the Hollywood period, when Golden Age of Grotesque starts, he gets engaged, uh, he marries the Defantis, and he starts being an artist. So he makes an album about art, and that's the moment when Marilyn Manson is already only that person, right? It's Brian Hugh Warner, it's his alter ego. And in this period, he studies this alter ego of his. One of the best examples of this even hyper real studying, it almost seems that. Manson read Baudrillard because sometimes he's mentioning things about uh, his theory and you can even see this in the Doppelherz movie which is a very underground movie made by Marilyn Manson in the time of Golden Age of Grotesque you can see I don't know if you can find it somewhere but try to see it and there he explains this weird combination of being a real physical person and an artist and he, study, he starts studying about the boundaries between reality and art. Because art, that's the, the media, that's the show thing, right? And reality is something else. But he starts thinking how to merge these two things. How to create this hyper-real loop. And by this, he stops recognizing between what is Marilyn Manson and what is or in this point of time was Brian Hugh Warner. So Marilyn Manson uh, gets divorced, he's heartbroken, he gets in love with Evan Rachel Wood and this is where he starts having this relationship but instead of using some parts of this relationship in his art like he did on Mechanical Animals with the relation of Rose McGovern or how he even did with the Devontees. Now the whole art is just an exposition of his relationships, starting with the divorce and continuing with the relationship with Evan Rachel Wood. In this point of time, Marilyn Manson starts using all those informations from the Doppelherz movie and from this part of the philosophy where he decided that the boundary between what is art and what is everyday life or real life should be dismantled, like put away. And that that's the real art, only what is life itself. And in the Doppelherz movie, he explains this, that basically he has to become what was only originally the, the show persona Marilyn Manson. He has to become this so that he doesn't become some kind of a showman. He wants this barrier between his 
super persona which he plays only on on the podium to be in his real life to merge these two personalities and that is in the time when he gets into the relationship with Evan Rachel Wood he starts romanticizing uh, serial killers again like he did all of his uh, art but this time it's different and even we have many evidences of uh, his speeches when he's talking about having plans to commit uh, suicide with his lover probably it's Evan Rachel Wood because we have information about that and we can see the thoughts that started all over at Antichrist Superstar in the song Mr. Superstar. Meryl Manson always played with the thought that he would commit suicide on the podium, on, on the stage. It's in all of her songs, you know, like in this song Mr. Superstar where he sings like, Oh, I wanna uh, that you kill yourself on TV, you know. And that was this thought in this period with Evan Rachel Wood that maybe they could commit this romantic suicide. Remember, he was heartbroken. This is his only album which goes inside of him. You know, he's deeply ashamed of this album because it shows so much about him. That's why he doesn't play the songs from the from this period anymore. And that's a key to his to his understanding. So in this period, he wanted it to end somehow, you know, according to his vision, but it didn't go out that way. Uh, he sings that at the Eat Me, Drink Me in the end, you know, she was she was supposed, you know, to get to the suicide, but the ending uh, didn't test well, you know, because Evan Rachel Wood, she went away from him after a massive period of the first uh, abusing, which happened on the tour of Eat Me, Drink Me, because in the time of making of the album, we don't have many allegations even from her about that. So that happened on the tour when he was a, in a lot of drugs involved and they were moving from one place to another and so on. So then she's going away and that's something that struck him, right? That well, he was heartbroken again. So after he lured her back, he got her back for several more years for the whole period of high and of low, which was the next period, he started figuring out a revenge for her. And that's what the whole album High End of Low is about. And that's the album when Merrill Manson himself started using this hyperreal theory. It's basically the end of this artistic uh, trilogy which he's making about art becoming real life and real life becoming art. And he started, he started uh, I remember it myself, posting on his MySpace social network uh, photos, for example, of uh, somebody's back with uh, scars on it from cuts and stuff like this. And in that time I thought that's part of some video he's making, or I don't know, so I liked it. And today all this is deleted, but you can find it on Manson Wiki and on other sites. You know, they are I archived all of this MySpace uh, posts. Not all of them, I will talk about that in the later video, but 99% of them, which is important in this, this case. So he started doing this and he started believing that he has to abuse Evan Rachel Wood cut her, beat her, and then make photos and pictures of her, how she's bleeding, and he considered that beautiful. He considered that art, real art, uh, not that fake art which only pretends things, right? So that was his thought. And this time he started believing and Basically, most of the evidence, of the direct evidence, which is not from the mouths of, of the women, outside of interviews, which are evidence full from the beginning till the end of the life of Marilyn Manson, because most of the things he committed, he admitted in interviews. Uh, the most part of evidence is from this period, high and of low, and of his social network posts. Because there, you can clearly see from the time of high and of low till all over the born villain period. 
you can see how he's posting things in this drug using uh, binges. It always starts somehow about art and then the next days it becomes heavier and heavier, right? And uh, it always ends very bloody. Then you have some period while he mostly sleeps and then it gets over again. And this time he really started believing that the goal is to kill Evan Rachel Wood and make an album about it and then blame her that she committed suicide, which is a perfect plan almost. And we have even evidence from the person who lived with Meryl Manson in his apartment and from Evan, which doesn't have to be objective, but we have these another evidence. And also from Meryl Manson himself, when he talked about the songs from the times of High and of Low and about the song Devour, they all admitted that this really happened, that uh, in December, uh, I will talk about this important dates, uh, about the December period in the next video, because that's too much for this, but let's mention that it happened in December. When Marilyn Manson tried, he was beating and um, abusing Evan Rachel Wood. She was on a long binge with him for that time. And he made her believe that they are committing couple suicide at the end of the album, that they will be like perfect. And she even swallowed all of the drugs, right? And then, and this is what we know from him, what he said about that. He said, yeah, but then I thought, he told her, I'm not the first one, you know, because I don't trust you, so you first. So he made her do it first, and then he thought, well, maybe it's uh, like a mess to, to kill myself. <laughs> Why should I do that? And then this uh, guy from living in the apartment came, and it's not clear totally, what made Marilyn Manson call the ambulance, but we know that Evan Rachel Wood was hospitalized, that it was this uh, attempt of suicide in that period. And uh, I think after this, this was, I think, the last or pre-last moment she was with Manson, uh, because this obviously was horrible. But I think she returned one more time, uh, which is astonishing, but you'll understand that later after I do all these things. So the high end of low period and born willing was the time when Marilyn Manson started believing that he has to break this, this uh, mirror, which is art, and make it into reality. He used it even in the names, you know, he said, what is death metal, you know? Current death metal is just blah, blah, blah. But if you have death metal, it, some people have to die, right? Uh, or he said, we're making killing songs, you know. But it has to be real, right? And it's important to mention that the first, one of the first incidents in Manson's life, the infamous Columbine shooting, which presumably was not connected to him, is not the only massacre which occurred around Merrill Manson. Uh, there is a school shooting in the early 2000s, in the early millennium, which is connected to him, and the shooter had his t-shirt. Uh, it's in the same time, or around that time, when he makes this uh, song, don't forget, Merrill Manson has a song where he directly says, so, you know, give me a picket sign, uh, take a gun, you know, go shoot out a school or a mall or shoot a president of whatever or whoever wants to fight. And in that period we have this. But we have also other killers. We have several killers. You can find it on Wikipedia about Merrill Manson. Uh, several killers who killed because of his songs or at least they said they did it because of this or because of his paintings. One of these paintings that's interesting is the painting when Marilyn Manson used Evan Rachel Wood and he portrayed her as the Dahlia, as the murdered woman. And he was like romantically telling her how he would kill her and that she will die and stuff like that. And this painting particularly inspired another guy <clears throat> who, who used it basically to, to kill his girlfriend. Uh, 
So you can study this. There are several massacres attributed to Manson. And around 2013, he starts counting his death count. Because he starts admitting, okay, maybe my plan is really sharing death, you know, but at least I'm real. That's what he was saying. And this, I believe, to be the consequence of this hyper-reality itself, because, don't forget one thing, we, every one of us, have the internet, have all the media or the commercials on the streets, we're constantly bombarded by information and stuff. So this hyper-reality changes us, it deforms us, somehow. But don't forget that even Marilyn Manson as a producer of part of this hyper-reality for others, of this media, he himself gets <clears throat> deformed by this hyper-reality of himself. His image, which he's portraying and which portrays originally his super-ego, as psychologists of Freudian type would call it, or his alter ego, his, his stage persona, this becomes him. And we see the same between the thoughts he has, you know, in the old times, he's thinking about this violent stuff, you know, but mostly, except the Antichrist Superstar era, which I will um, analyze in a detail later in a video, you can mostly see that Marilyn Manson discerns between reality and fiction in that time. I'm, I'm even convinced that in the time of uh, the Columbine shooting, he didn't consider it really to be connected with him because he, his intention was not in that time to produce killers or shooters, but something that dif different, you know, like um, explaining things about American culture. I don't want to dive into this, but I think in that time he didn't consider it to be a good thing, you know. But much later, we can see that he's kind of proud of this murderers and shooters and he becomes the thing he originally got his name from the charles manson name this is the hyper real image which starts deforming himself because if you study all the informations even from himself from the interviews from all the victims we know that in the period um, in it's an album called heaven upside down it's around 2017 and stuff like this uh, he started making a cult. His videos about it are about it. His uh, imagery is taken straightly from the American Horrors 7 series, The Cult. You know, he uses this in the Tattooed in Reverse uh, video, which is not original at all because it's just promos for the American Horror Stories show, which was a year before. And But Marilyn Manson uses all of this. Many of the groups which are connected of the fan groups are called cult of Marilyn Manson or family of Marilyn Manson don't forget Charles Manson's uh, group was named family nice and that's the topic of from the whole beginning you know portrait of an American family his first album of Marilyn Manson you know he was trying to explain why the conservative Christian families don't work in America and that was right you know in some some way you know there was some problems in that time and he started being something like a community or family member for all those disassociated teens in those times. So this is how he really created a family. And in this time, Heaven Upside Down, he starts using this family much more heavily for abusing and threatening and scaring women who were abused by him and started talking. You know, that's in the time when all of these informations were was not official. Uh, Evan Ridgewood and several others uh, were already talking, for example, in front of the Congress, but they never mentioned Merrill Manson. And uh, so people on the YouTube and everywhere were like thinking, like, who is it? Blah, blah, blah. But in those times, Marilyn Manson was actively threatening those women. Uh, we hear about it from the women. And now, again... You, can, you don't have to trust that, but you can see in the same time when the women say they, he was threatening me with things like, I know where you fucking live and giving his fans addresses of my house and stuff like this. We see in the same time, Marilyn Manson really does it. He has a song, We Know Where You Fucking Live on his album, which 
explicitly describes that he and his fans will come burn your house down and kill you and stuff like that in horrible descriptions. Uh, and this song is followed by another song where Marlon Manson, it, it's a song called Kill For Me. And it's a song for all of his fans where he's saying, you know, I won't be kissing you if you don't kill for me. So will you kill, kill, kill for me? And all the fans on the, so on the, on the shows, they always do like, yeah, I will kill for you. And that's a way how he used his hyper real image the hyperreal family community he has created to even further, you know, he was making art about threatening this women he has abused. And he was using this art, the same art, not only about informing them, them about this, but also as an encouragement for his fans. He was sending emails which uh, were saying this, you know, and stuff like this, connecting all, all the dots with, we know where you fucking live, you know, kill, <laughs> basically killing. He wanted his fans to kill Evan Rachel Wood and all the, and some other women probably. But mainly Evan Rachel Wood, be, if you have seen the Rising Phoenix documentary, you can see it from Evan's perspective that night. But you can see it even from Marilyn Manson's uh, perspective, from uh, the messages he has written to all these things, you know, they are uncovered, so it's not... Uh, you can look at the tag, um, that's very important. Study all these informations for yourself, you know. Look at Manson is abusive or Merrill Manson is an abuser or stuff like this. Always tag it, it's on Tumblr or Twitter. You know, they have great, like hundreds of informations you can study it for yourself and use it for your theories. But according to what I've seen, he started using his art in... A profound way which some would say revolutionary but which basically comes back to Charles Manson. Charles Manson had a group named Family where he was singing to disassociated teens and was sending them to kill people like Sharon Tate and her unborn child and all those people there and he thought like I never killed someone you know I'm, I'm not guilty and that's what Merle Manson wanted also you know if a fan would kill Evan Rachel Wood and her child, which he threatened to do, and which we probably planned to do if she had not moved and it would happen. He would say, like, you know, I'm, I'm not guilty for my fans. That's what he always says. So, in a way, this was almost genius, you know. He was, like, globally threatening this women and encouraging people to do this too. And nobody noticed. You know, that's unbelievable. So how did he do it exactly? Uh, how did he do it exactly? Uh, you can see that Marlon Manson from the beginning, he is very much into internet technologies, you know, about uh, getting into somebody's laptop, co copying his information, you know, getting dirt on people, sending them viruses to, to control their like sending e uh, emails for them and messages for them. That's all we have accounts from even the beginnings of his career. Uh, in the later part, we see that Merrill Manson really is in contact with many, many of his fan groups. Now, recently, 2023 and 22, you can see it that Merrill Manson doesn't post new pictures and photos because that would make attention, blah, blah, blah. So he's sending his new photos to his club fans and they are publishing it. So he's using this net. And he always did this, you know. He's like rewarding them for being his fans and they feel this charismatic uh, image which he has around himself, this gloriola. So they do his biddings. And we have the evidence first that he basically has it for two sides, right? For young girls, his main goal was to get them to a concert and he has this uh, guy named Jude, <laughs> you can study about him. He's the one who is like helping him to drug and get all the girls and to get them aboard with... Because he mostly like starts texting to some fan, you know, and they don't know it's Manson, then they find out, they are amazed, you know, and then he invites them. And of course he invites them then he gives them like some drugs. So of course they do it because they're with 
Manson, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly it turns into a several day binge when they start being abused. We have many testimonies from this about young girls which have been through this and they mostly rationalize it after, uh, especially because like they cannot even some parts, you know, these girls are not used to drugs. So when you have this weird kind of binges where in the end you don't sleep for three days and don't eat and then somebody rapes, you know, it's not kind, it's kind of blurred everything. So that's what he uses. And for the male fans, he uses it not for fucking them because, uh, although I will make a video about his gay connection, which is very interesting, but that's not an interesting, like important topic. He uses his male, uh, fans for, like I said, threatening the women and sending them to do things. This is basically him making a hyper-real religious cult movement. And we have to start recognizing this. Um, when I was presenting this in front of many like European professors and stuff like this on the university, I was very nervous how they would react how many, uh, how they would dive into it and stuff like this. But I was uh, surprised that most of them studied some of the evidences or even knew about this and agreed with my point of view that Marilyn Manson has become something which even academians should describe as being a new religious movement, like a cult, which really has a criminal violent and abusive side to it and there is no reason to exclude Merrill Manson's cult from other cults like Charles Manson's cult or anything from Scientology to Jim Jones and anything basically. So that's why me and other people from Charles University started diving into this. I hope this introduction got you interested how how more how more the rabbit hole goes and how many more informations and uh, academic theories can can show us something about his life next time i want to deep dive into the december periods because in my opinion and according to what i've written in a book which you can even uh, order i will put the link into a description. It's in English, Crimes of Marilyn Manson. I'm convinced that in December 2012, Marilyn Manson committed murder. Um, and the reasons of it, I will explain very detailedly. It's not something, and that's very important, you know, people will say, so do you have evidences like from all this women and blah, blah. But that's not a part of investigation I'm doing. That's what all those organizations for women rights are doing and they are doing it brilliantly what i am doing it and adding to all of this is showing that Merrill manson doesn't do like art separately and then abusing women sometimes that's not his case the abusing of women is his art and if we study his art we can find out what's missing in the evidence of the abuse and this is a methodology which I want to explain you in the next couple of videos. I hope uh, you're hyped for it and I'm waiting for your comments. So thank you and have a nice evening.